I do a lot of, of the Galileos and Nyla Bones and things like that versus the treats. All right, well, tonight, this is going to be Ask the Vet Questions Night. So we have brought Dr. Billy Ding in, and she is going to be answering your questions about all the things you wanted to know about puppies. All righty. Well, like Charlotte said, this is Ask the Veterinarian Night. So what I'm going to do is start out and talk about some of the most frequent questions that people have for me when they bring home a new puppy. Uh, now, you may have questions about these topics, or you may have questions about things totally unrelated, and please ask them. And you can ask them while I'm talking. You can ask after I'm done. Feel free to go ahead and break in. Now, I'm going to start with feeding, because that's probably the most common question I get when somebody brings home a new puppy, is how should I feed this puppy appropriately? Now, to start with, I'm going to assume you all are feeding your puppy a good, quality, name brand puppy food appropriate for the size of your puppy's breed. We're just going to assume that. There's lots of good types of dog foods on the market, so I'm not going to go into any of that. We're just going to assume you're already doing that. But let's talk about how often you ought to feed these guys. Now, a lot of that depends on how old they are when you bring them home, because the younger the puppy, the more frequently they need to eat. And if you'll draw the analogy to a human baby, a lot of your questions about your puppy will come as common sense sort of things. Just like a baby, inf an infant human needs to eat very, very frequently, the younger the puppy, the more frequently they're going to need to eat. Most of the time, young puppies will come into our homes around five to seven weeks of age. Um, these puppies need to eat about four times a day during their waking hours. That's not assuming that you're going to get up in the middle of the night and feed them because most puppies are going to be fine throughout the night. Now, there's an exception when we're talking about the little bitty breeds, the Chihuahuas, the Yorkies, the Teacup Poodles. We're going to talk about that a little bit more after I'm done. But unless you're talking about a really, really tiny breed of puppy, four times a day when then they're in that five to seven week of age range is a pretty good idea as a generality. Now, seven to 12 weeks of age, most of the time these guys can go down to three times a day. Spread out during the day, during your, the waking hours. And then after 12 weeks of age, most of the time you can cut them down to twice a day. So that is as a general rule. Now, I've talked about the frequency of feeding. You, you notice I haven't talked about leaving their food down all day. And that's really not a very good idea for a couple of reasons. Um, it will make it harder to house train them if they nibble throughout the day. Uh, it also will tend to make them a little pickier if they're just eating little bits at a time. So I encourage you to get your puppies used to eating at discrete meal times. Put their food down, leave it down for 10 or 15 minutes, and pick it up. Okay, and then they will start to learn, just like a child will, that, that they need to eat their food when you put it down. Okay, now if we've got the little bitty guys, those puppies have much faster metabolisms and they need to eat more frequently. So if you've got little puppies in the one or two pound range, these guys are probably going to need to eat at least every four hours during the day. Again, most of these puppies, as long as they're healthy, are going to go through the night just fine. But these guys require more frequent feeding. So if, if you do end up with one of these really, really tiny breeds, keep in mind you've got to feed them more frequently. Okay? Now, um, when I ask folks what they're feeding their puppies when they come in and see me for the first time, probably 90% of them tell me dry food of some variety. Um, and... If I can draw that analogy back to human babies again, we would not in our wildest dreams take a baby off of a bottle and immediately start feeding them potato chips and hamburgers. But we somehow think that it's appropriate to start feeding a very young puppy dry food. Now, sometimes we'll moisten it. But still, keep in mind that this is a tremendous change from what they're used to when they've been nursing mom. Now, if they've been totally weaned and on dry food for a while, that may be a different, different thing. But many times when you bring home a young puppy, several things are at work here. Number one, they're really, really stressed. You know, they've left their home, they've left their support structure, their mom, their brothers and sisters, and they've gone into a totally new environment, and they're scared. That's going to affect their appetite. 
Secondly, they don't have the competition of their brothers and sisters to make them want to eat. And thirdly, they may not be weaned completely. You may be told they've been weaned, but unless they're totally separate from mom, chances are they've been sneaking back there for a snack. So these puppies may be nibbling on dry food with their brothers and sisters, but they may not be getting that many of their nutrients from it. So I encourage you to feed your young puppies when you bring them home some canned food. Now, if you just absolutely can't bring yourself to do that, by all means moisten their dry food. But keep in mind canned food is going to typically be more palatable or taste better to them. And during that time frame when they first come home, we want them to, to eat. We don't want them to go a day or two without eating. That's one of the most frequent things I see when people bring a new puppy home is they haven't eaten for two or three days. So Monday morning here you are with a lethargic puppy that's dehydrated and low on blood sugar because they haven't eaten. So don't hesitate to feed them a good quality canned food, even if they haven't been on it. And don't hesitate to continue feeding that um, for at least that 12 week period uh, where they're really getting adjusted to their new home. I think that's very, very important. Now the small breed dogs will really do much, much better if they're on some canned food in addition to their dry food. Dry food is, is harder for their little immature intestinal tracts to digest. The other thing is, when we're feeding them dry food, these puppies, particularly if they're not weaned completely, may not be used to drinking that much water. So we take them from a situation where they've been getting, you know, over a 90% water diet to a 90% dry matter diet. If we'll feed them canned food, we're going to be including a certain amount of water in the food we're giving them. So dehydration is not as much of a factor. Uh, keeping water in front of these puppies is not as much of a factor. So that's something for you all to kind of keep in mind. Now, talking about water, a lot of people ask me if they need to leave water in with their puppies all the time. I'll kind of let into this. If you're feeding them canned food, they're getting a lot of water out of their diet. Um, but certainly they need access to water throughout the day. However, if they're drinking lots of water late in the evening, it may be hard for them to make it through the night without needing to, to go outside and urinate. So, you know, most of my clients will take their, their water up from puppies when they put them to bed. And that's okay. It's okay to do that. It's also okay to not necessarily leave water in the crate with the puppy if they make a mess as long as you're checking these puppies at fairly frequent intervals. Which kind of leads me into the next topic people ask me. When we keep puppies in crates or little confinement areas or by themselves at home in the laundry room, how long can we leave them safely? Um, Charlotte has led into this, uh, but in my experience, you don't want to go much longer than about six hours without checking on a very young puppy. Okay? Uh, now, the smaller breeds, the little teeny tiny ones, you need to, to check on them more frequently because they're going to need to be fed more frequently. But, the, but for other than the really tiny breeds, probably shouldn't go longer than six hours when they're under 12 weeks of age. Okay, now that means if we're working eight, nine, ten hour work days, somehow or another we need to, to have somebody check on those puppies, take a break in the middle of the day, take them to work with us, or do something so that we're making sure those puppies aren't going for too long without having access to food and water, being sure they're okay, having an opportunity to go outside. So as a general rule of thumb, that's what I'd encourage you to do. A lot of times after puppies get over their rapid growth phase, which is usually in the 6 to 9 to 12 month of age range, there will be a short period of time when your, your young dog or puppy will stop eating as much. It may only be for a few days, but if you notice this, what they're telling you is, my nutritional needs have changed a little bit, I don't need quite this much food. And if you will be sensitive to this, and cut back a little bit, you will tend to keep this puppy at a, a normal optimum weight. But if we, if we ignore this and keep feeding 
more calories than they really need, then they'll get to where they're eating it because they're in front. It's in front of them. Just like we'll eat more of a really good meal than we really need because it tastes good. And then this will be the first step towards these guys getting to be heavier than they need to be or obese. So that doesn't really relate to these young guys right now, but it is something for you just to be aware of because most puppies will go through that that little phase where they'll kind of tell you, hey. You know, I don't need quite so much. But in, in his case, I would wonder if maybe we're not putting down a little more than he needs. He's at a nice weight. He's not, he's not too fat, but that's the first thing I would, well, would play I, with. We've been feeding him three times a day, and I want to get him off that second that middle feeding, mm -hmm. so maybe I should just go twice a day. And that, that could be a big aspect of it, too. And when I talked about this three times a day feeding, a lot of times these guys will tell you when they don't need it anymore because they will stop being as interested in each meal. So then experiment. Cut them down to twice a day and see if it works better. That's an okay thing to do. I'm still feeding Daisy three times a day, uh -huh. and we've gradually gone up from like a third cup each feeding. Now we're up to a cup each feeding. Mm -hmm. When do you know? I know how to look at her to see how I, the ideal weight, mm -hmm. but when do you? When is the maximum? How much should they? Well, that's a very good question, particularly in light of the fact that you're talking about a large breed puppy. Uh, golden Retrievers, Labradors, Boxers, all these large breed puppies need to be fed very, very carefully so that they don't get too big too fast and they need to be fed a large breed puppy food, which I'm sure you're doing. Uh, and you are correct to use her body as your guide. You are looking at her and making sure that she's slender to determine how much you feed her. So you're doing exactly the right thing. Um, what I tell my clients is to be very restrictive in the calories that you feed them up to about the six month of age range. So, so be careful in increasing the food. Um, you know, if she's absolutely gaunt, or if she doesn't have enough energy to go play, you probably need to feed her more food. Uh, but, but as long as she is active and playful and still continuing to grow at a slow but steady rate, you know, increase that by small increments, a quarter of a cup at a time, okay? And then once they get to that six month of age range, you can, can feel like you can start increasing that food a little more, continuing to make sure that they have a nice discreet waistline both looking down from the top and from the side so that they have a wasp-like waist. That's a very, very good question. I've been recently reading this book on boxers, uh -huh. specific to boxers, and one of the things that it said in there that I had never heard of before was uh, that boxers are a little more susceptible to bloat. I didn't even know what bloat was. This is my fifth boxer. Mm -hmm. And do, do I need to worry about that? I mean, especially with dry food, he'll inhale it, drink a lot of water, and then go running around afterwards. All large breeds can be susceptible to bloat. Uh, and typically we worry about the deep chested breeds as being susceptible to this. Um, studies have indicated uh, a direct correlation between the number of times per day that a dog is fed um, and whether that food is fed in a dry form or not. So from a, a prevention of bloat standpoint, we recommend that feed dogs be fed twice a day, not once a day, and that that food probably be fed in a, a wet form. Now, you may be feeding dry food, but you may, may want to mix it with water because that's going to decrease the likelihood of it getting in the stomach and then, then expanding and bloating. Lots of other things have been implicated. Hard play right after they eat, and he does that. rolling he does around. Um, for the most part, we haven't been able to draw direct correlations to any of those things. But I do think that, it's, that it is safer, as far as the bloat thing is concerned, to feed them twice a day and to, to mix some water with that dry food or some canned food with that dry food or something so you're not just feeding a dry kibble that then has the potential to kind of expand and, and swell up. So go ahead. I've never had a bulldog before, and this is the only dog I've ever had that right either before or right after the dog eats, he'll start having the hiccups, and I don't know if that's bad or... It's very normal. Puppies have hiccups all the time. Have any of you heard an adult dog hiccup? I never have. In 24 years of being a veterinarian, I have never heard an adult dog hiccup, but puppies hiccup 
all the time. It's okay. very, very normal. Why? Is it that they eat too fast? They go no, air? no, you know, hiccups are a, 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 a kind of a spasm of a nerve that travels across the diaphragm. So possibly as the puppy's growing and that diaphragm is stretching, maybe it's stimulating that nerve. We don't know, but it is something that happens all the time with puppies, and it's very, very normal. Now, the other thing that happens very frequently with puppies, also with older dogs, but, but a, lot of, a lot of us notice it for the first time with our puppies, is puppies will do a lot of what seems like dreaming while they're sleeping. They'll do a lot of jerking around, and they may, be, may, may yip or bark, they may moan and groan. Some people think they're having a seizure. This is called activated sleep, and it involves muscle fasciculations uh, and, and contractions of the different muscles. Puppies that don't do this actually do not mature normally. They don't grow normally. So that's something that normal puppies do, um, and, it, it, and older dogs will do this sometimes also. But don't worry about this if you see it. It's not a seizure. It's perfectly normal, and it's healthy. One last thing about feeding your puppies. A lot of folks ask me how long they need to feed puppy food. And we all know that from an advertising standpoint, we're supposed to feed it for the first full year of our puppy's life. From a marketing standpoint, that's a good thing. From a veterinary standpoint, we want to feed a puppy food through the rapid growth phase of our puppy's uh, life. That's usually six to nine months of age. So once they get past that point, it's a good time to move them on to their adult food. They don't necessarily need all those extra calories and all that extra protein. And we certainly don't want to feed adult dogs puppy food because that, that creates more of a workload for their bodies. They don't need that level of nutrients once they get into adulthood. So six to nine months of age for most, most puppies is just fine. Now, next I want to talk about exposing our puppies to people and other dogs. Um, it is a very, very good thing to socialize puppies. That's what you guys are all doing right now. And when we socialize our puppies, we're trying to socialize them to not only other dogs, but certainly to other people. When puppies are very young, when you first bring them home, and before they're fully protected against infectious disease, which is usually around 16 to 18 weeks of age, we want to be very cautious in our exposure of these puppies to unvaccinated dogs. Okay, so coming to a puppy class like this where we know that all the other puppies have been checked, they're healthy, they've been vaccinated, is a fine thing, but we don't want to expose these guys to dogs that we don't know are protected from infectious diseases. So what we don't want to do at this point, before 16 to 18 weeks of age, is take them out to public places like the park or the city market or a, a big pet food superstore or maybe even walking down the sidewalk because you don't know what that dog they meet might be carrying. And even though they may have had one or two vaccinations, until they are 16 to 18 weeks of age, they're not fully protected against things like distemper and parvovirus. Very, very important. So now is the time to keep these guys in a safe environment at home or in a, in a very predictable environment like this where all these other puppies are healthy. But during this time is when you want to expose them to all kinds of different people. You'd like these guys to be exposed to every kind of person that you want them to be well adjusted to. Men, women, kids, people in uniform, and by all means, strangers. Okay? If we keep them at home and never expose them to anybody but our family, all of a sudden, when people start coming over to our house, they're going to be scared because they don't know who these people are and they see them as a threat. So during the formative time, up to four months of age, if we can expose these guys to lots of different people in a real positive way, they will start to see strangers as their friends. Uh, so by all means, invite everybody over, have a puppy party. 
Have all your friends meet the puppy. Have them give your puppy treats so that when your puppy sees a stranger come to the door, they anticipate that they're going to get something wonderful to eat. If we're worried about our dogs being watchdogs for security purposes, just having them there is enough. They don't have to actually be aggressive to fulfill that goal of being a security provider for us. So get all kinds of people over. Now, certainly we want to have kids come over and be exposed to our puppies because sometimes if we get these puppies as adults and we don't have a lot of kids in our family, then all of a sudden somebody comes over with a three-year-old and the dog goes berserk. So make sure that if you don't have kids, invite some folks over that have them so that these puppies get used to kids. But one word of caution, kids have a lot of energy. So 12 kids and a, and a very young puppy may not be the right combination. I'd keep the kids to like level numbers of three or less so that they don't overwhelm the puppy. But be sure that we get ex exposure to kids when they're at this really, really young age, okay? Um, now, some other kind of scheduling things I want to talk about, depending on the age of your puppy. A lot of puppies will need some grooming as they get older. They've got long enough hair that they're going to need to go to a groomer to be groomed. A lot of people ask when they should do that for the first time. Certainly, we don't want to wait too long, but we do want our puppies to be protected against these contagious diseases because a grooming shop's going to have lots of dogs there. So once your puppy is past that, that uh, tw uh, 16 to 18 week of age range and your veterinarian says that they've finished all their shots, then is the time to get them acquainted with your groomer. Okay? They need to learn at an early age what clippers are, what it's like to get their nails trimmed, their ears cleaned out and all that kind of stuff. If we wait till they're a year of age, that, that is going to be a much tougher thing for them to do. So by all means, get them established with a groomer so that they know from the get-go that this is a fun experience, not a scary one. And to prepare them for that, or to make life easier for your veterinarian. At this age, it's a wonderful thing to get these guys used to opening up their mouths. Sticking your fingers in their ears, pulling on their tails, picking up their feet and wiggling their toes. If they get used to this at home, then the first time we try to trim their toenails, it won't be such a traumatic experience for either the puppy or their veterinarian. So kind of get in the habit of doing that even on a daily basis. And then, then the puppy will be much easier to handle if they have a veterinary problem they have to be examined. All right. Now, scheduling neutering. Um, most all of our pets are going to be spayed or neutered, and we want to do that at specific times. Female dogs will come into heat around six months of age. There is no medical or behavioral reason to have a female dog go through a heat cycle. It doesn't help them in any way. And it does increase their, the incidence of cancer later in life, specifically mammary cancer. So these female dogs are, will be much healthier if we can spay them before they ever go into heat. So if you know you're not going to breed your dog, between five and six months of age is a wonderful time. That way you know you're going to beat that first heat cycle. Now, our little boys are going to reach sexual maturity a little bit later than that. But once they do, they're going to start hiking their leg in your house. And actually, their testosterone levels are going to be highest at six months of age than they will be for the rest of their life. So your house training will be much easier if you go ahead and neuter these guys at five to six months of age. Veteran from a veterinary standpoint, it's a very safe time to do it, and that will make your life a lot, lot easier. So five to six months of age for both males and females as far as neutering. That's our recommendation. I frequently have a lot of clients ask me about the whole neutering five or six months. They want to wait longer for their male dogs because they think that testosterone helps build more muscles, they're going to get bigger and they want a big dog, they want a big macho dog, and they don't think that that's going to happen if they neuter them that young. What's the, your take on that? Actually, neutering an animal makes them grow larger, believe it or not. A lot of people don't realize this, but a dog will get larger if they are, a male dog will get larger if they are neutered. Uh, and they will, the, the level of muscle development a dog is going to depend on how much exercise they get, not whether they have testosterone or not. 
Also, it's not going to affect their performance. A lot of times people that have uh, sporting breed dogs will feel that they're not going to be as good a hunter if they are neutered. Uh, and that is, is a fallacy. Most of the time they're going to be able to concentrate better if they don't have all that testosterone running around in their veins. So from that standpoint, no need to, to hold off on neutering a dog. Now, there is one aspect of neutering a male dog we do need to be aware of. When we do remove the testosterone from male dogs, they may tend to get heavier than an unneutered male dog. So if once we neuter these males, we need to watch their, their waistlines. And if they start to get pudgy, we need to cut back on their calories. This is not a bad thing. You can feed less dog food that way. But, but that's the only thing that's going to be affected by neutering them, Charlotte. Okay. okay? Cool. All righty. Yes, Carl. You had uh, talked about exercise. Uh -huh. And my goal was to get out and run with my pup. And I know I shouldn't do it too soon, but when's a good time to start that sort of activity? It's a great question. Obviously, these guys need lots of exercise. Um, but it's important to realize that dogs on their own uh, engage in intermittent activity. A dog will run around like crazy and then stop, stop and sniff, and then run around like crazy and then stop and dig, and then run around like crazy and stop and scratch. But what they don't do is they don't run nonstop for several miles or for 45 minutes. So when we have young puppies particularly, we don't want to, to encourage them to do excessive exercise outside of what is normal puppy play. Now normal puppy play is one thing, but if we're gonna take a dog out on a hike or take them out for a walk or go out and jog with our dogs, best to wait till they're at least six months of age and probably that six to nine month of age range is a little better. And the reason is, Growing puppies have, still have unfused growth plates. Their bones are very delicate. Um, over exertion and constant uh, impact on their bones and joints can cause damage. And another good way to think about this is you would not t let your seven-year-old go to the gym and lift weights. You wouldn't let your seven-year-old child go run five miles. We want to take the same approach to a young puppy. So while they're young, if, we've got, if we want to take them out and, and do training for a sporting breed dog, if we want to take them out for a walk with us, I really encourage you to keep it to about 15 or 20 minutes maximum until they're about six months of age. Okay, that will be much healthier for them. Otherwise, go out in the backyard and play like crazy, but let them do that intermittent puppy play type of exercise. All righty. Now, a uh, couple other things. Uh, I think Charlotte has talked to you about appropriate and safe toys for your puppies. Um, and what I want to do is kind of mention some of the inappropriate toys that I see because what I end up doing is I end up treating puppies for the consequences of, of, being, of playing with inappropriate or dangerous toys. So let me just kind of give you a little bit of food for thought. Anything a puppy can ingest or swallow is potentially life-threatening. So when we give puppies toys, we need to be very cautious of something that they can either swallow on its own or that they can chew up and swallow. And a lot of times what happens is we start out with this little teeny tiny puppy that can't get their mouth around the Pepsi bottle, but they're sure having fun rolling it around on the ground. And over the course of a couple weeks, they double in size and their teeth get a lot stronger and all of a sudden, they can chew into that Pepsi bottle, live, uh, bite it into shreds and swallow it. And then all of a sudden, we have a puppy with an intestinal foreign body that requires emergency surgery. So do not give your puppies things that they can chew up and swallow of any kind. And I get puppies in here with plastic pop containers uh, I get them in here with uh, 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 aluminum pop cans. And you guys have no idea what an aluminum can does once they bite through it. I've had to reattach tongues. So these things are not safe items. I think a lot of us have seen uh, the story about the dog that swallowed the butcher knife. 
Okay, if you, if dogs can swallow incredibly large things. They can swallow pretty good sized balls. Uh, they can swallow linear objects like knives, pins, things like that. So be very, very cautious about what you give your puppies access to. Also watch some pet toys that you buy. You may, you may do, buy your dog a, a, a perfectly nice latex dog toy with a squeaky in it. If they are going to destroy that, squeakies do not always pass through the intestinal tract. So if you have a dog that destroys their toys, monitor that and get them some of these harder toys that they can't do this with, like Kongs and, and some of these interactive toys that they have. But be very, very careful. Now, last but not least, one of the most dangerous things a dog can do is eat fabric. Towels, socks, pieces of shirts, um, string-like items. It, you wouldn't think it, but fabric gets into the intestinal tract and burrows into the lining of the intestinal tract and can fold it up like an accordion. One of our most serious most life-threatening uh, causes of intestinal obstruction is eating cloth. And this includes their bedding. So if you're putting a towel in there, a little crate liner, and your puppy decides to, to chew it up for recreation while you're gone, this can be life-threatening. If you see this scenario, pull it out. These guys may not be able to have bedding. Even as adults, there's a pretty good percentage of my patients that cannot have bedding in with them because they will eat it. And who's to say that dog may have chewed it up and spit it out 50 times in a row, but the time it decides to chew it up and swallow it may be the time that you're coming to see your veterinarian for emergency surgery. So be very cautious of that and, and try to avoid letting them have access to that kind of material. Other things that puppies do all the time is eat junk. You know, you let them out in the yard, and all of a sudden they start eating every stick, stone, and leaf in sight. And what do you do? I mean, they do it every time. You figure this has got to be normal. It is, and it can, and frequently does, make them sick. Because if they eat enough leaves and sticks and rocks, they're going to have intestinal problems. One of the most common causes of a dog, a puppy coming in for vomiting and diarrhea is that they're out in the yard grazing on stuff. Um, so it's, it's kind of the same rule of thumb that you take with a toddler. you got to go out and, and you, you basically can't leave them unsupervised. And if they're going to go out there and graze on everything in sight, you're going to have to take it away from them. Uh, or you may just end up with, with more frequent trips to the veterinarian than you'd like to. Now, the other thing people ask me is, why does my dog eat grass? Because it tastes good. Um, it's not because they don't have a good balanced diet. It's not because they need to make themselves throw up. It's because it tastes good. And if you watch a dog in the spring when the grass is new, they'll go out there and graze like a cow. It tastes really, really good. Keep in mind that dogs are omnivores then omnivores, just like us, they need all the major food groups. They don't just need meat. Now, cats are carnivores. They, they need meat. Only meat, they need meat. Dogs are omnivores. They need vegetables in their diet as well as meat. And in the wild, dogs uh, get this not only by eating grass and things like that, but by eating whole animals that have probably eaten plant material, partially digested it, so when they eat the intestinal tract of that rabbit, they're fulfilling some of their, their nutritional needs. They evolved to meet those needs, however, on their own. So they're going to go out and eat this stuff as a way of, of, of nature telling them how they fulfill their nutritional needs. Probably don't need it, but they've evolved through the years to go do that. Now, if they eat enough grass, will it upset their stomach? Certainly. If they eat the grass that the, uh, the lawn service has just sprayed with herbicide, will it, will it cause problems? most certainly. And some, some herbicides and pesticides can cause cancerous changes in dogs. So these things all, you know, we all need to take this into account and be cautious when our dogs go out there and start grazing, but it is a natural thing for them to do. Dogs cannot handle heat, and a lot of times we don't realize the extent of this. We sweat through our pores or our skin. Dogs do not. Dogs eliminate excess heat by panting, 
and a very small amount by heat exchange through their ears. The larger the dog, the more heat they have to eliminate and the harder time they have eliminating excess heat. So a large breed dog is, it has a difficult time not getting overheated. There can also be dramatic differences in a dog's tolerance to heat. You may have two dogs of the same breed that are vastly different in their ability to handle heat. Lastly, a short nose breed like a boxer mm -hmm. is going to be more impaired because they're going to have a little more trouble moving air because of the, sh the, the, the constricted airways they have because of their, sh their shorter face. So at, all you can really do is realize that any time after or above 80 degrees, you need to be concerned about the dog showing signs that they may be getting heat stressed. Okay. And if you see that, a lot of times, if you've got a highly motivated dog, you're not going to see it until they drop. So in those circumstances, if they've been going nonstop for more than 20 minutes, you probably want to do something to interrupt that activity. Okay. So if, if we are in, in heat situations that are over even 80 degrees, we want to be very cautious if we've got a puppy that's really going nonstop. If it's been more than, say, 20 minutes, you probably want to intervene and slow that puppy down somehow. Now, there's a couple of ways to do this. You may just physically grab them and say, quit running around and playing. Come in you come into the house. If you're taking a walk, you may want to try to get that puppy to go take a little dip in the creek that you're walking by, or you may want to hose them down. But somehow or another, the first thing to do would be to try to cause, to somehow cause that puppy or, or dog to slow down. You bring them to you and put them in a sit stay and just make them stay there for a while. If you feel like your dog is in distress, this is a crisis situation and it needs to be dealt with quickly. And the biggest thing that you need to do is figure out a way to cool that dog down as quickly as you can. So you need to get them to water and you need to hose them down. You need to get them in a creek. Uh, you need to send somebody to, you know, go, go get a jug of water and pour over them. Do anything you can to cool that dog down. If you are away from, from your home environment, Pick the dog up and carry it home. Do not make them continue to walk. Get them home, get them cool, uh, and, 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 and realize that getting them wet quickly is one of the best things you can do. If this kind of a situation happens and you feel like you've got the dog cooled down, it's still a good idea to check with your veterinarian. Most of the time, what you're talking about is more a heat stress situation than a heat stroke. But because some individuals can be very sensitive to this, you want to be cautious. And, you know, we're talking about the short, short-nosed breeds. This little bulldog, I've seen, I have seen adult bulldogs overheat indoors in, in you know, 80-degree situations. Uh, so you need to be very, very cautious. And, again, don't hesitate. If you think the dog is hot, get them wet and cool them down. Uh, a lot of times in here, if I feel like I've got a dog that, that is getting hot even in a boarding situation, and, you know, whether uh, it, it, we've still got the air conditioner on, but that dog appears to be hot, I'll put a bag of ice in there, run with them, you know, and just let them cuddle up to the ice to where they can cool off. So, so don't hesitate to do that, and then be sure you, get, you check with your veterinarian.